So how long have you been guiding for? I'm going into my fourth year. Next season will be my fourth year. Well, Rod, you want to say about what rod you're using? Yeah, well, anyone who knows me knows I'm a Renegade fan. Hereaway Renegades designed by Jerry French. Can't beat them. I can be, you can see what we're fishing, what we're fishing here, really close quarters. You can see all the willows. You now imagine I could only be here. You're not gonna do this with a long belly line or a mid belly line. I mean, if you can, you're a pretty skilled guy, but I've got a sink tip on and big heavy fly. Well, we're not fishing heavy flies today, but a big profile fly and that sort of thing. So this is close quarters fishing. And, and if I need to, it, you know, can also deliver, deliver really far. Short rods with a short shooting head. Change out the tip, whether you want it a dry tip or a sink tip, whatever. But the rod flex profile and and how that shooting head's design allows us to be really, really efficient, simple casting in super close quarters. Fishing big high banks, rocky high banks where there's no back cast whatsoever. Willow lines like this. It doesn't get much closer with no back casting room than this. You said you got a commando head on there? I do fish the commando head. There's several different line options that are viable for the Renegades. It can be a preference point. I just, I like the length and grain density of the commando head. And of course the commando heads were the pioneer short line. Anything out there now is trying to just imitate. It's a good line. So you, when you're at this body of water right here, what are you looking at? Like, why would you choose this type of water? This type of water, a little fast. We're in the head of this soda right now. Uh, but as we work down, we get a really nice defined seam with soft water edge on the inside. And They'll follow that seam line up traveling and mill around in the soft stuff. And this is where we're, we're casting out across that seam line, letting our fly and sink tip get dug down a bit. And then when it swings into the zone, we're right there, perfect depth. And whether we're a little high in the column, that doesn't matter for summer steelhead, they'll come up and chomp it. Right now we have excellent water temperatures. We have excellent sky cover. Uh, I mean, if there was a little less, if there's a little more visibility, I would be feeling just as comfy doing a skated fly on the surface, even in this spot. So what's your go-to fly at this time of year? Say with the, with these conditions, obviously you said skaters. My line. There you go. Uh, typically with this condition, you know, I can stand and I'm in mid-thigh deep water here, and I can see my toes with my glasses on. So, you know what, we've got a little over three foot of visibility, which, you know, you could still use just about anything. Um, I, I'm sticking with a Skagit style setup with the sink tip, and I've got a hobo spay on right now. It's a light, unweighted fly with decent profile it's on that middle ground of being small bug but also still big enough profile in these conditions with with a little bit of dirt in the water that i'm not too worried about it if it was muddier i might go bigger intruder kind of fly but again unweighted because what happens when when the river came up and all this mud and everything was in here it forces them into the sides along the edges here, right what we're waiting, right off the willow line. And, and so in those situations, what I wouldn't want to do is have a too heavy of a sink tip or too heavy of a fly 
I want to be able to get into these soft edges below me right tight to the bank and have it not get stuck to the bottom. I want, it, I want them looking up at it. Right now, we're, we're able to get away with treating it like a winter steelhead situation with a slightly less heavy fly. You know, a fly about two and a half inches in length with a good profile, something like that. That's good all year round. Winter steelheading and in, in good visibility. I, that's about the little snack pack size fly that I'm doing. You know, big intruder probably be about the length of what I have left on the cigar here. Maybe four inches tops. And you see guys out here with six inch, big mondo lead eyed intruders going like this all day. <clears throat> I'm stuck to the bottom. Meanwhile, the fish are here and they're stuck in the bottom out there. Cause they're just, their eyes are designed to look up, right? They look forward and up. So you don't want to fish under their bellies. So what cast are you doing here? Right now I'm utilizing an upstream cast, the Snap T or the Circle Spay, C Spay. There's a few different names for it. The goal here is just, you know, get it off my upstream shoulder and be able to cast it. I just got chomped by something. A little trout or a smolt. But to be able to cast it at a, a slightly harder downstream angle than if I were casting on my downstream side, it, it would be more natural to kind of cast perpendicular. And that would look like this. And this would give me more sink time with a double spay. Oh. Sometimes that's, there's a reason I was using the other cast. Exactly. But if I wanted more sink time, I could get it out there. I can mend it out if I needed. And that's another nice thing about those short lines is but quicker load so you don't have to have a longer D-loop, right? Correct. You don't need as big of a D-loop. There's not as much line there to do a big full spay D-loop like that. Uh, yeah, this spot though, because I want to fish this water here, that's why I'd rather be tight like this and casting my, in fact, you might want to come downstream of me, but doing that uh, snap key cast is more appropriate for this situation. Or an upstream peri poke would be all right, or a single spay if you could do it, whatever your abilities allow. Your single spay. Same kind of angle, no real mend. I'm just letting the sink tip do its job, slowing everything down as slow as I can possibly get it swinging. And then by the time it hits that desired zone of where I think my target is, I should be at that perfect kind of equilibrium. I'm not too deep, not way up in the column that they're not gonna come for it. Something they're just gonna easily be able to grab a snack real quick. Do you steelhead have kind of like a radius to where you're trying to stay, say like three feet above their head or anything like that? Um, not necessarily. I would say a lot of that, a lot of that's water temperature dependent and clarity dependent. So I fish the North Umpqua River with a dry line and a skated fly or a, oh, 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 oh it's a little uh, yeah, I saw the jump. He's on there. Is he? Yeah. God, he hammered me for a second. <laughs> I knew something was. <laughs> hey, we're on the board, though. That's number two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you're fishing the clack in this river, which we are today, this is not a rainbow trout. A salmon or a steelhead smoke. Not a rainbow trout. 
lot of people will come out here spring and summer after they've released a bunch of smolts. See, now the, the cast that I was doing, my snap T or single spade, because I have a wind coming at me now, is even more appropriate. Get that line behind you. Yeah. Now I can't come blow into my face. Anyhow, those are smolt of salmon and steelhead, not rainbow trout. They are not to be taken home eating these. They're too little to eat too, but I see people take out buckets. Yes, treating them like sardines for their pizza? Something. So you were saying earlier about how you um, intermediate um, shorter lines. What makes this spot good for that? Well, no matter what you're shooting, head length is this would be a good spot uh, for an intermediate shooting head just to help get things down quicker and more evenly on the swing across. You can see the main channel out there's got some power to it. And as soon as my fly and sink tip hit out there, I get swept out a little bit. If I wanted to have a slower swing from the outside in and get that long, slow, full swing from edge of seam in, that's what dredging, well, not really dredging, but having that intermediate head put more line under the water surface will get a really, really slow presentation. And it'll help, help equate to more fish in theory, right? Yeah. It always depends on if there's a fish there for, for your fly to get in front of, but something like that would definitely. This would be a good spot too. They designed some lines. Airflow had like the fist, which was a multi-density line that really dredged down deep and had a portion of sink to it. Um, something like this would be good, where it's got a big buckety fast outside. But again, I would use something lighter on the terminal end as far as the fly goes. I wouldn't have my big lead-eyed flies on there because you wouldn't make it all the way in. So say you're talking to someone, they just getting in, just wanting to get into spay casting. What are, let's say, five tips and... Um, five tips you'd give them for starting out and five flies you would tell them to learn to tie or buy. For steelhead in the Pacific Northwest, uh, well, as far as flies go, intruders definitely on that board. Um, learning that and the history of all that would be a pretty good starting platform into tying and and what we're doing with modern steelhead flies these days, whether it's on a tube, a shank, whatever. Um, I mean, the fly to me doesn't necessarily matter. Like there's not a specific pattern or color combo. It's more, I just want movement in the fly and I'm looking for con like high contrast, stark contrast, and then decent profile. Beyond that, as long as they can see it, you know, I'll choose bright colors to go with whatever the water clarity is or dark colors versus that. And then I bring the sky into that equation. Today we've got a nice gray overcast so I can fish, you know, darker flies, blues, black and blues, that sort of thing. I'm actually fishing red right now. But red's one of those I'll fish in any condition. It's bright enough in the stained water and it's also a great fly uh, on clear, low clear situations where you have a bright day. It's bright enough to be considered a bright fly. Red's an excellent color for fishing behind someone. If you had fished through here and you were uh, fishing a black and blue or purple, whatever standard steelhead color combo, I'd most likely choose a red. Oh, did you see that? Get another one? I just got ripped. It was a smolt again, but he fucking <laughs> drilled me. See, even the, the renegade is so sensitive 
that you get those smaller fish, even for eight weight, you get a little yeah. heart jolting excitement on your big, you know, big spay rod stuff. And those things aren't even more than like, like five like inches. It doesn't bend the rod at all. If I've I've had some smolts on like my big fourteen foot spay rod. I didn't even know it was there until I was stripping in the line. Yeah. And this one we had you saw the one earlier and then the one we had before that, like you can feel it in the tip. It's, it's nice. Yeah. A little faster on my swing speed here. See, it's in these nice, soft, flat edges where I'm really looking to find something that's just kind of taking a little break in the soft stuff. They're lazy by nature. Salmon and steelhead are only going to deplete as much energy as necessary to get to their spawning ground. And knowing that gives us the information we need to kind of figure out how to read water and find these fish. Of course, time on the water. I'll come tight. Got swirly complex surface current there that I was able to kind of slightly mend it out. And you'll notice a lot of times I say I did a mend, you won't even see what I did because all I did was do this by picking up line off the water. I'm not doing like a mend. You know, I'm not. A lot of guys will make their cast and they'll do this right away. Make the perfect cap. And you see that fly skitter across the top 10 feet back towards me? Yeah. And now look, I'm not fishing. I'm not fishing. It's still unconnected. Now I'm fishing. Now it's kind of fishing. And granted, I got deeper probably but most likely as soon as everything came under tension that it's going to raise it back up to where it would have been anyway without the men so what i do is i treat men's and this is a travis johnson thing i picked up i treat like you men when necessary if i made a, a cast that needed it like I need my fly line was ahead of the fly and the fly was up here and I needed to reorient it straight. I just do a gentle lift and reorient it straight and mend it. Not this big cumbersome thing trying to impart sink to it. I don't I've got a sink tip on it. The fly's gonna get down. I'll have to mend it for that. So trust your sink tip to actually do its job. Yeah. You don't need to do it for it. There's and there's a time and place for a big slack men like that to sink. You know, there's some rivers that have a different structure to it that require big lead-eyed flies, the, like the tungsten and all that stuff, to drop immediately, like immediately. And there's spaces here where you could do that too. But for a big, even run like this, it's not necessary at all. So if somebody wanted to find you and hire you for a guided trip, where could they find you at? I can be found at www.riverwiseanglers.com, 503-737-4890, Clackamas River, Sandy River, Winter Steelhead, Summer Steelhead on the Clackamas, some bass, some trout all there on the website before we go any other tips you'd want to give somebody to get out here and well, oh, back to your, your beginner and what advice I'd give them first thing for spay so we went over the flies right for spay casting in general First thing I would say to do is hire a guide to at least give you 
casting lessons. Going and hiring a good instructor to teach you how the fundamentals of a spay cast will cut that learning curve to ribbons. You won't be out here feeling, uh, you know, like people are making fun of you because you made a funny cast or whatever. You won't be out here self-consciously fishing. You get right into the game. You've got the fundamentals behind you. Um, and then, it, you, like I said, you're gonna, that learning curve will flatten greatly. It's what we're here for, is to help you maximize your time and experience on the water. We're not out here just to take the money. You get far more out of it than we do. At least with me, anyway. <laughs> and that's something you do, too, is like the casting lessons on the water. Casting and. Lessons. Oh, that's gone now. Uh, I do casting lessons both. That's biodegradable, by the way. <laughs> uh, both spay and single hand. I primarily use the short rod system like this, but I can teach you on your 16 foot rod all the way down to a 9 foot rod. Whatever you got. Jet boat rides on the Clackamas. What we're doing today. Ooh, I just got another new tuck. There's a lot of smoke in here. Generally, I kind of skip out on a spot that's like chock full of smoke because I'm just going to get hammered and hammered and hammered. That'd be my biggest piece of advice to the beginner is don't go it alone. Save your, your investment into the gear, seems big, but Put the investment up front into lessons. Learn what we're doing and why. Get a good fundamental background on what this is all about. And then you can apply it to any steelhead salmon situation pretty much. And in the end, if you think about it, you end up saving money anyways because you're not going to be buying all the gear you don't need. Right. Well, a good guide's going to help line you out on, on what what products will work best for you as opposed to what products we just want to sell. Uh, they're going to help you not only learn the cast, but understand what grain weights are and what your flex profiles are, and what your different sink tips and lengths and your materials, like the whole shebang that goes into it, you get that understanding of why. When, how, that's, you know, rather than sifting through all the information you can find online or in books that don't necessarily pertain to your particular watershed. Now, steelhead is steelhead is steelhead. I can fish this same situation fly set up on the Skagit River and be equally as effective. Uh, but some places do have more productive pieces to it, like more specific. Uh, I wouldn't fish the same on the North Umpqua as I'm fishing here necessarily. It's what I'm trying to get at there. But it, the fundamentals give you those options to be able to adapt this into just about everything. It's far more difficult to discern all that information and weed through all the information that's out there than it is to have a guy like me be like, well, this is what we're doing and here's how we do it and this is why. So, Cool. Anything else you want to get out there before uh, we go? I think that's it. Just... Fingers crossed for a big piece of chrome here. Uh, my main thing out on the water, aside, outside of the fishing, is safety. Learn the river, learn your boats, learn what you're doing out there, wear your life vests. It takes one little slip and you're done out here. Wintertime, we're fishing in frigid water get water over the top of you, you can be hypothermic like that. Be mindful, wear studs, use your wading staff, and please wear your life jackets. 
There's not many weeks that go by throughout a busy season on this river that somebody didn't fall out of a boat, turn a boat over, fall off the bank. You know, there's, you can drown in a spoonful of water or whatever they say, in three inches of water basically. So safety is key. Learn your abilities. Don't go wade super complex, difficult water all for the sake of catching a fish. There's better, easier places you can do that. And if you want to learn these harder, more difficult, technical spots, then hire a guide that knows it well and does it often. And they can help teach you how to enjoy yourself in, in those more extreme situations and still stay upright and dry and keep 10 toes and fingers going. None of this out here is worth your life or an injury. And nothing ruins a good day like drowning. That big sulfur right there. Ooh, that's cool. Got him. All right. It's such a beautiful color of yellow. <laughs> but yeah. Yellow, that'd be a good, good piece of advice. Nobody fishes yellow for steel. <laughs> but I guarantee it works. That's true. I don't have a single yellow fly in my box, I don't think. All right. Well, this is Brian Stenson at Riverwise Anglers. Give him a call.